insolvency. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anthony Idibwe, who uh, is our tutor for today. Um, Anthony Idibwe holds a PhD from the Osgood Law, Hall Law School, University. Uh, Carlo, Carlo, if you can mute your system, Woletu, I think uh, it's interruption from there. Sorry, I'll start again. Anthony Dibwe is currently um, holds a PhD from the Osgood Hall Law School, York University, Toronto, Canada. Uh, he's a visiting professor at the Christopher University in Canada. Um, he holds a G. LLM postgraduate degree from University of Toronto 2015, an LLM from Robert Governor University Aberdeen, Scotland uh, 2012, and many other degrees. He was licensed to practice as a lawyer in Ontario, Canada in June 2016 and Nigeria in 1983. He was elevated to the rank of Senior Advocate of Nigeria in July 2000 and appointed notary public in 1989. Anthony is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Canadian Association of Nigerian Lawyers. Uh, Anthony is the president of Punuka Consulting Inc. in Canada, a senior partner at Punuka Attorneys and Solicitors, a full service law practice with offices in Lagos, Abuja, and Asaba, Nigeria. He's a fellow of Insol International, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, London, Business Recovery and Insolvency Practitioners Association of Nigeria, Brighton, and International Bar Association. He's also a member of several national and international bodies, including Association of International Petroleum Negotiators, London Court of International Arbitration, Lagos Court of Arbitration, International Chamber of Commerce, Nigeria, Institute of Directors, and International Insolvency Institute, to name a few. Anthony Dibwe has been involved in various insolvency and commercial um, arbitrations, including ICC arbitrations, in the capacity of chairman, member, council, or party representative. He's a prolific writer and author of several published works in insolvency, arbitration, capital markets, to name a few. And I would just like to say myself before yielding the floor to the learned senior advocate of Nigeria, that I am extremely delighted to have Dr. Anthony Dibwe as the um, lead uh, presenter for this series. Um, Chief Idiwe has been one of our greatest pillars, not just in the profession, but particularly for the MBA ICLE. He's delivered many mentorship trainings. Indeed, he's a, a mentor to me and I'm sure Okori too, and Kubi and so many of us. Uh, it's not that we don't get to see him as often as we would love to, but uh, he's a great role model and um, he's a gift that uh, just doesn't stop giving. So. Uh, I would just say a big thank you to Dr. Anthony Dubuay and say, welcome, sir. I yield the floor to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tobena. Um, first of all, let me just um, apologize that I'm on the road. And um, I hope that my uh, internet will remain stable for, for, for me to be able to communicate. Um, it's a great pleasure to be uh, here uh, to share a few thoughts on uh, the principles of corporate insolvency um, within a historical context. Um, essentially, um, the history of corporate insolvency is tied um, to personal merchant bankruptcy and the norms around it. Um, so, for example, while it was the uh, for the purpose of trading, um, and then enjoy some sympathy in case he runs into some difficulty in the course of trading. Uh, historically, a non-trader was not expected to borrow at all, and if a non-trader borrowed, uh, was expected to pay the debt obligation. Uh, because he's not trading. So, you know, that was the system, sorry, that he wasn't taking any uh, risk. Um, uh, please, can you go to the next um, slide? Yeah, the next slide. Um, the next slide, yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> so the, the obligation to pay a debt for an individual who was not a trader 
was historically immutable. Um, so it must be paid by, uh, by the person or by the person's family forever. Uh, according to a writer, uh, uh, Leventhal, uh, he argues that if the individual failed to pay, and so if if you went um, like it's on the slide historically um, um, in Mesopotamia under the Babylonian code, uh, Babylonian code. Uh, of uh, Hammarambi, your body or um, it was the collateral. So, so uh, what this meant consequently um, was inability to pay that was an act of bankruptcy deserving of criminal punishment up to capital punishment. Uh, so capital punishment, which means kill the person for not paying the debt, uh, was quite usual at that time. Um, and then there were other options like hostage taking. They will come and carry your children or, you know, carry your, there'll be a raid, uh, etc. Uh, and other measures, you know, and at times the, the state supports these measures. Uh, so, um, you see some of those um, uh, practices in the ancient times, either in ancient Egypt or uh, in, uh, in, in Greece. Uh, you can go to the next um, slide. Um, so, for instance, under the Roman 12 table legislation of BC before Christ, um, uh, 451 to 450, uh, there was a rule allowing the creditors to cut their debtors into pieces and share the body. You know, so <laughs> it was execution against the person and not the debtor's property. But eventually, uh, under the um, Roman law, it, it moved from liquidation to liquidation of the debtor's assets and loss of societal um, status or standing, which you can refer to as uh, capitis uh, diminutio. So, actually, um, this 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 marked the idea of instead of killing the person for owing, to taking the person's assets, you know, killing the person and sharing the body of the person, to sharing the the property of the person, marked a shift from the norm from. Um, uh, retaliation to compensation. So instead of retaliation, uh, it moved to uh, compensation. Uh, you, you can go to the next slide. <coughs> so uh, this shift in the Roman law, uh, as I said, uh, was significant uh, from moving from body to property. Now, as recently as the 19th century, so that, you know, I just want to move forward from Roman times to, say, 19th century um, England. Thousands of people were in jail in the UK and in Europe, generally, for failure to pay their debt. Now, for instance, uh, John Dickens was a Royal Navy clerk who ran into debt and ended up in prison with his wife and his children, and most of his children, except his son, Charles, uh, who was sent to live with a relative and worked at a shoe factory for a year, which inspired him to write the book, Oliver Twist, which most of us um, uh, read as, uh, um, um, as, as um, students. And that, that book was about uh, an infant who was born um, in, a, in a workhouse. So relief from death or punishment for inability to pay was extended to traders as distinct from individual individual debtors by other members of the trade association that you belong to. So in other words, if you were, you can't get relief, you can't get relief from paying your debt at all if you are just an individual borrower. But if you belong to a trade or an association, the association can come together and then uh, give you some relief and say, okay, well, if you can't pay, we understand, we know business is bad because we're all in the same business. We can give you more time to pay 
uh, etc. So it's only when you belong to a trade group or an association that you get that kind of relief. So the, 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 the norms, therefore, were set essentially by these trade associations. The norms around whether you get relief, whether you pay the full amount, you know, was always around uh, um, these um, traders, you know. So um, the state was not really involved in setting the norms. Um, for instance, the, the, the first time you would see some inkling of the state being involved in setting the norms, um, according to Professor Christoph um, Paulus, um, was when Emperor Augustus um, allowed debtors who failed to pay their debt through no fault of theirs to keep their dignity. Um, like I said, in the Roman law, apart from the fact that you lost your person initially, then you lost your dignity uh, and all your property. But if if you if you if it was as a result of no fault on your part, then you you didn't lose your dignity under um, uh, Emperor Augustus. But that didn't last long because most of Europe, uh, with the collapse of the Roman Empire, uh, basically scrapped that um, that rule. So you lost your dignity, and I've just given you the example of how. You know, UST sent to jail. It was a shameful thing. It was regarded as dishonesty. If you didn't pay your debt, the best inkling that you could get um, a relief. So, in other words, state involvement in setting bankruptcy norms is a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, so, the, the significant trade norms that have historically influenced insolvency pr principles can be listed as follows. One, breaking the table or bench, uh, from which the word bankruptcy itself is derived, which is uh, banca rota, uh, which is a, an Italian word came up around the Middle Ages, and is the process of breaking the trader's table or bench in the marketplace as a way to exclude the trader who is unable to pay his, their, uh, his debt uh, um, owed to the other um, uh, traders in the market. So in other words, you know, in the market, people use tables to, to put their wares. They will break your table, basically, to say that you don't have a table to trade again. You get out of the um, Out of the valley was taking flight to unknown parts to obtain rehabilitation. So usually, if they break your table, you can't trade again, so you have to go away. And usually, they'll travel abroad. If they make it, they can come back. And uh, remember that debt is immutable. They'll still have to pay off everybody again uh, before they will be admitted. Uh, so the the, the, the the second norm was always taking flight to unknown parts. That's the only way you could get rehabilitation. And then the third norm I wanted to talk about was an English norm called keeping house, which means when you are inside your house, your house is your uh, is your castle. You, the, the, the belief will not break into your house to come and levy execution. You know, uh, they had that practice, um, uh, and it's sort of related to taking flight. So, but remember that when you are inside your house, it means you can't come out. If you come out, they will levy execution, and, and execution could include sending you to prison, cutting your ear. Um, you know, and all that stuff. So the relief, just stay inside your house, but you'll be excluded from society completely because you can't come out. Um, so eventually, <laughs> many laws were even used in England to try and uh, uh, still get the debtors out of their house or reach them abroad uh, and to punish them for not paying their debt. Uh, for instance, the English law allowed the bankruptcy commissioner to break into the house, collect the assets, cut off the ears of the debtor. Uh, in those days, the tactics used to uh, deal with uh, uh, insolvency, of course, included beheading, uh, seizure of your fellow countrymen. So even if you fled, uh, they can see somebody else from your village or from your uh, country, the same country, which is back to the old stuff about uh, hostage taking. Uh, so actually, if you look at it from the time of, uh, you know, we've been having bankruptcy, uh, bank collapses, 
uh, for a long time, right up to um, has been private organizations that used to play the major role in setting the insolvency norms. Um, now, uh, however, um, uh, there were certain laws that started came, uh, coming up, like in 1705, they, they had the Statute of Anne, which introduced the charge for cooperative debtors. So if you are cooperative, you know, uh, you could be discharged and you will not be put to death. Uh, but the discharge was not automatic. It required creditors' consent, uh, a procedure that took many years. The, the creditors never really used to consent. Uh, and I, I'm saying all this so that we can look at how do you position our, our what is your mental state today in, in Nigeria, even you as a lawyer? Uh, do you have the mental state that people must always pay their debt? Is it mutable? Uh, do you believe that uh, consent of all creditors are required for you? If I think something wrong with your uh, volume, can I hear you? To give any relief uh, or maybe a certain majority, sorry, you, you know, uh, these are just... Um, uh, uh, talking about no voluntary bankruptcies uh, in England for Biden. Sorry, Chief, you are frozen for break? a while. For a while, yes. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. The internet, yeah. I'm so sorry. So I was just saying uh, that, you know, these things I'm talking about, that we should use it to position ourselves as lawyers today. Think about it. Think about what your mindset is. Where are you in this discussion I'm having? Are you a lawyer who thinks that a debt is immutable and that somebody must pay it no matter what. Are you a, a lawyer who thinks that um, an honest debtor, you know, who for no... fault of his out of maybe market risk relief? Are you a lawyer who thinks that uh, nobody should get a discharge from a debt except every single creditor consents? Uh, or do you think that if a majority consents, it should be enough to bind all of them? You know, so even though I'm talking about history, these things relate to the present because today, as you're dealing with cases, you are facing the same issues where you have to decide uh, whether somebody should get relief, whether somebody shouldn't get relief, etc. So anyway, but just to fast track, that the government started getting involved in the 19th century where um uh, uh you know you 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 would find that uh, uh let me say two things happen uh, one was the rise of the joint stock companies right the joint stock companies um uh, as you know most of you that it uh, company law they actually banned joint stock companies following the uh, South Sea bubble bust. Uh, they did this through the Bubble Act of 1820, which prohibited joint stock companies. So the only way you could form a company in England was to get a charter from the, the king or the queen uh, uh, through a, a royal prerogative, or you get the parliament to pass a specific law. Uh, allowing you to set up a company, which of course you knew was only government companies. It was very difficult for individuals, but individuals could get charter, but you have to have access to the queen or the king, which was very difficult. So the majority of people started complaining. And then after some years, uh, between 1844 and 1856, uh, two laws were set up where were where passed to allow joint stock companies. Uh, and that allowed, we know the rest, so I won't talk about companies. Now, the idea of companies, the masses through limited liability, uh, you know, uh, limited to shares, um, uh, and then the, the um, separate uh, corporate personality. And uh, the challenge has always been how to balance that uh, with preventing fraud. Um, so what did they do in that uh, system, you know, to balance it, you know, prevent fraud? as well as encourage people to have the ability to do business with limited liability. Um, 
So the solution was this. Those two laws required companies to keep financial statements, capturing their assets and liabilities, which creditors could look up to, to satisfy their claims. So by this requirement, the norm moved from keeping the house. Remember I said that as a, a private individual, if you stayed inside your house, nobody will levy execution against you, so long as you're inside your house. But if you, you just step out they, what they said is if you keep your proper books of accounts as a company and you do your business normally then nobody will hold you personally liable right uh, so it's like keeping the house so they then called it bookkeeping so the norm move from keeping the house to bookkeeping by the company so if the company technically keeps its books properly it will not be subjected to the adverse effects of bankruptcy so um, eventually, the government got more and more involved, um, and then they started setting up official receiver. Uh, then the court started playing a role in winding up the company, um, uh, etc. So uh, this is just background in terms of the English development. Um, um, and then you have the U.S. development, which is a little bit different in the U.S. Um, Um, reason be, the U.S. passed four bankruptcy laws. Uh, it quickly removed the limitation of bankruptcy to the trader, uh, unlike in other places. <clears throat> it allowed voluntary and involuntary bankruptcy by, by non-traders. And it instituted um, generous discharge, moratorium, and restructuring. The system wanted little government involvement, unlike the U.K. So they didn't have all the, they had bankruptcy trustees, but they didn't trust in it. So they didn't like uh, the idea of uh, government officials, official receivers, all those stuff uh, in the in the U.S. And they like to protect the honest but unfortunate debtor through generous relief, through discharges, etc. You know, including a complete discharge. Because in many countries, they, when they even when the idea of discharge came, they didn't like to discharge the debtor. Some would give ten years before they would discharge the debtor. You know, all the other consequences they exclude the debtor from uh, politics, from this and that. Uh, fast forward and say, what's our own attitude in Nigeria with respect to all this? What does our own personal bankruptcy law uh, say? Uh, where are we in this frame of what I'm uh, um, talking about? So remember that this um uh, this discussion is just a high level uh, peak at the the trends and things that are happening in bankruptcy um uh, and restructuring just for for you to have the frame for you to now receive the more detailed discussions that will come with the other presenters so um uh, us went so far in 1978 to do the bankruptcy code which introduced reorganization without proof of um uh, insolvency. But that's against the background of uh, the 1933 laws and all those ones they did that allowed uh, reorganization because the railways, when they were collapsing, people had security over the railway, but from, uh, say, Adriatic to uh, Akure. But the railway line is going all the way to Lagos. They won't let you, if the, if the com company goes bankrupt, they won't let you come and collect the, the iron on that railway. Uh, because if you do, then the rail, the rail will not be able to travel on it. So what they do is that they make sure that they consolidate it all and then sell, sell it to a new person. And then you just take what you can get. That's, that's how they started reorganization. So um, in summary, uh, because it's more of a discussion and just high-level uh, issues that I'm talking about today. Uh, what are the trends in corporate insolvency? One, you can put them in, in maybe I can say three buckets, three buckets. Bucket number one is liquidation, liquidation, right? So what does liquidation? Liquidation man, the liquidation talks collect all the assets. Now you are not we are no longer talking of killing the person, right? Collect all the assets of the person and sell those assets 
distribute it to the creditors. And then in distributing it to the creditors, they have certain policies, certain uh, um, uh, principles. One, equal treatment of all creditors of the same class. Priority of creditors, depending on whether they are secured or secured, etc. And then a moratorium uh, to stop some creditors from taking advantage of um, uh, a race to get their own when the others haven't gotten because you want to treat them equally. So uh, once the liquidation process starts, you stop other people from uh, going to take the assets and uh, take care of themselves without the others being taken care of. A lot of focus in liquidation on the creditors and not the other state. Called us, right? The community trend. The other trend in insolvency is uh, rescue. Now, and the, the issue is to rescue the business, not the company. So, what this trend tries to do is to identify the whether there's a going consign value in the company. Like I told you about the railway company, where you can't really break up the because once you break up the railway track, then uh, essentially they, it cannot perform the job of being a railway, uh, and therefore there will be less value for everybody. So and jobs will be lost. Okay, but the point is that the people who were who were running the company or who were shareholders and the rest um, uh, may may actually uh, be the ones that need to lose. So, but the business needs to survive. So, for instance, you can convert the, the creditors to become the new shareholders. Uh, and then, because the old shareholders have those values, so they convert and then they take over the company and put a new management and hope to recover. So, uh, that, that is one way you can deal uh, with um, a rescue, uh, uh, preserving the going concern value and the jobs. Uh, and at times you talk about uh, uh, today, you talk about relief from uh, financial distress. In fact, they are saying you don't really need to be insolvent before you go to court and seek uh, some sort of rescue or relief. It's enough that uh, uh, you have some level of financial um, uh, distress. So the third bucket of what um, is playing in insolvency today is how do you deal with an honest debtor? And as how do you actually decide who is an honest debtor? Because this raises a lot of issues. Uh, because people will say, depending on this, the school of thought where you are, whether you are in that side, that school of thought that says that a debt is immutable and you must always pay the debt no matter what. Or whether you are... Debt is not immutable. It depends on the circumstance, Right. Depending on the circumstance, we can give relief to people to save jobs and the rest. So, uh, particularly if the person was honest in how the person was doing business and it was just a market risk, the question now is how do you determine that? And, and these are difficulties that have, as I've shown historically have been there, but are even more today on your table as a, a, a lawyer. So we come to uh, the Nigerian law today. What has happened? Uh, there has been some shift uh, in the law, particularly as it relates to corporate insolvency. I can't say that the same thing has happened with respect to personal insolvency. So with respect to corporate insolvency, the way the Nigerian law was before, it was more focused on liquidation. That is, collect the assets, share it among the creditors, and leave everybody, and that's it, right? But with the 20 2020 comma, it now in arrangement, I'm sure somebody will tell you more about it, and then the administration. These are uh, arrangements that uh, for a certain majority, it's possible to get approval uh, to give relief to uh, a, an insolvent uh, or financially distressed uh, uh, company. So I will not go more into it just to say that those procedures are there now for corporate insolvency. For individual insolvency, uh, you still need to, uh, it doesn't encourage the law, the personal insolvency law. And I think somebody will talk about it in more detail, so I won't go into it. Um, does not seem to encourage voluntary bankruptcy, as you would have, say, in America and now in many parts of Europe. 
where you can go to court and say, I'm bankrupt, declare me bankrupt. And then you can still be president of America, uh, like Donald Trump, who had gone to declare himself bankrupt uh, president of America. Uh, in Nigeria, there's a lot of stigmatization. Uh, if you went to say you are bankrupt, right? Uh, you'll be deprived of so many things under the law. And even the procedure requires that there should be a judgment against you, uh, etc. So uh, that's a difficulty. I don't want to go into the details, but I, I think that you want to look at it in the context of the historical um, uh, uh, discussion we've had to say, where do you place Nigerian corporate insolvency? Where do you place Nigerian personal insolvency within these uh, big issues and trends and norms? And then how, how, where do you place yourself as a lawyer? And how do you think you can, uh, as a lawyer, be a tool to encourage uh, business um, uh, using some of these tools and to advise your clients when they come in in terms of options that are available for them to resolve uh, their financial distress. Uh, thank you so much. That's this welcome uh, uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Uh, thank you, Lena, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, for a very brilliant, uh, brilliantly presented uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, I'll just um, call on Kubi now to uh, take question time. I can't see any questions in the Q&A box, but could be your, it's your job to lead on this. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Lene Silk. And thank you, Tobina. Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Lene Silk. I, I bet if it was a physical gathering, I would have asked us to give Lene Silk a round of applause. Um, so we have about 15 minutes to take questions. I can't see any question for now, but I'll, I'll, I'll just ask um, Lena Silk to make some clarifications or ask questions arising from um, Lena Silk's presentation. So um, Lena Silk, you, you did talk about, you know, trace the history of insolvency and then down to restructuring, and then you highlighted um, development in relation to the Nigerian legal framework. So you made mention of the fact that um, Kama has made some introductions as regards um, restructuring and corporate rescue. I would like to have your thoughts on this because I mean, this um, rescue and restructuring framework were introduced um, back in 2020. It's been three years now, and it seemed that things are a bit silent on the restructuring bit. We're still having um, so many creditors opting to wind up their debtors rather than, you know, give them a second chance, opting for CVAs, that's company voluntary arrangement or administration. What do you think is responsible for this attitude? People still being, creditors still being inclined to liquidation as opposed to restructuring or opting for company voluntary arrangement. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, question. Um, I, I think the, the um, answer is not in the lack of availability of the tool because the tool is now available uh, uh, through the uh, CVA, but is the mental uh, mindset of uh, the creditors. Um, it, uh, and, and at times, you know, I wouldn't really blame the creditors, you know. Um, the, 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 you see, remember that I ended by, I said there are three issues. One, whether there is honest debtor, right? Uh -huh. And then res uh, rescue um, and then liquidation. So um, it's, it's, I don't think it. It's really too fair to say that the creditors haven't changed their attitude, right? If the debtors are also not honest, right? So if the debtor is hiding assets in uh, Sokoto, uh, in Abuja, uh, and pretending that his uh, business uh, has a problem when he has iPhone most of the money, and he, you know, he has married uh, uh, ten wives, you know, uh, and he has moved the monies abroad. 
So it's not because the business collapsed because of market forces, right? Then you would usually see the creditors um, uh, uh, fight to the finish. Let's put it that way. And and when you look at um, you look at if you look at the research data, and you see the percentage recovery that is made in say Europe, and the one in Nigeria. So uh, even with the restructuring scheme, you will see they are still recovering about 70% uh, and then in Nigeria the minute you open up uh, recovery you find if you even look at uh, what Amcom is recovering you will find that they are recovering maybe 30 kobo in the dollar whereas in other systems they are recovering 17 80 kobo in the dollar right it means that something is happening where the other side of what I mentioned the honest debtor it's a problem, which is what is affecting maybe the attitude of the creditor. Um, so, so it's the two sides of the coin that will make it work. So the the debtors themselves have to be honest in how they run their business and how they, they keep their accounts. Remember, I said bookkeeping, you know, because that is what gives you the protection, right? Uh, um, in the in the old norm. So you keep your books properly. You run the business properly. So if somebody comes and looks at it and sees you know, you've done the best you can do, then they, they will be more amenable to restructuring. But, but if, if they, they, there is no honest debtor, then you see the creditor being so desperate because their likely recovery is going to be so bad, right, the, the, the level. So they are mixed. That's uh, what I've seen. But the, that having been said, there are a few, one or two instances um, of successful CVA that's, occurred there are some administrations that are going on so i guess this will pick up uh and i guess maybe we need to do more education more enlightenment uh etc around these uh trends these issues that are playing uh that i've mentioned thank you thank you leonard sok I, I i think the questions are coming in now um there is one here and he wants to find out the distinction or difference between a letter of demand and a statutory demand pursuant to, I believe, section 572, paragraph A of the Companies and Allied Matters Act. Let, let us look. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, that, that's a that good, uh, yes. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, now, there, there are there are what you call uh, technical acts of bankruptcy, okay, and uh, that are listed. So technical acts of bankruptcy that are listed. So, uh, so when you do a demand letter, for instance, that is just uh, a demand letter, right? But when you do a section. Um, uh, a section, uh, the, that's the comma section, demand notice of 21 days, right? You are trying to, what, what the, you know, the, the, the problem or the difficulty for the court is how do you determine that somebody is a bankrupt or has become insolvent, right? Uh, and there are different principles. There's, if they cannot meet their debt as it falls due, that's one definition of bankruptcy. Uh, one says that if their liabilities exceed their asset, that's another definition of bankruptcy. But when the court, what the court tries to set some criteria by which they decide that you have become bankrupt, and then they have technical acts of bankruptcy. People criticize it. Why should you have technical acts of bankruptcy? One, they say, if the, the value of the money. So they said the value, it used to be very small before in Nigeria. I think they've increased it to 250000 now under the new law. So if you are not able to pay a debt of 250000 and a, a, a notice in line with that um, provision has been served on you, then technically you are bankrupt. So you can go to the next stage. The court, can just, the court doesn't have to do the mathematics and uh, asset and uh, liability. 
bankruptcy and all that. So the court just follows the technical acts of bankruptcy apart from this one. But it's the quickest one to have access to the bankruptcy, uh, the winding up relief. So that's the difference between a mere demand letter and a demand that is made to try and establish a technical act of bankruptcy. Thank you. Thank you, Lena Silk. So um, there's a question here that says, how can someone know the appropriate option for a company facing financial crisis in the interest of the creditors? So does the company go into liquidation or should they um, attempt you know, going into an administration for the purpose of rescue? Okay, um, thank you so much. Well, um, usually, um, what the there is some sort of provision that uh, puts an obligation on the directors to stop trading when they know that the company is unlikely to be able to meet the obligations they will be incurring. So um, before the standard was very high, the, uh, you had to show fraud. Today, uh, wrongful trading is enough for the directors to be liable. So, um, uh, so ideally, as a director, if you know that the company is trading when they know they can't pay, then you are supposed to issue a notice of stop trading. Uh, and then if they continue, you resign as a director. Uh, the one alternative, uh, other alternative is to consult a, uh, uh, an expert, which will be an insolvency expert, to help you um, uh, do a diagnostic analysis. And from that diagnostic analysis, they will be able to know uh, where the cash is bleeding and then what options are available, whether uh, it will be uh, to... to do a CVA, to use admin. So yeah, it's a process. That's what I can say. So, um, and it's not necessarily that uh, the lawyer would know everything, but the lawyer may work with an insolvency practitioner uh, to advise the uh, client. So collaboration for success in this area, you know, I know lawyers, uh, you know, I can't, uh, I want to do the brief. I want to, uh, I want to do everything. Uh-huh. One of the uh, professional uh, obligations of lawyers is to make sure that any area of law you get into, you have sufficient competence. If you don't, that you can get it as quickly as possible without jeopardizing the business of the of the client. And also, uh, if you don't, to collaborate with others that have it. So the idea of lawyer wanting to take the whole brief, knowing everything, you know, it's not the correct approach. You must network, you must collaborate, you must have around you all the necessary. That, uh, you know, it increases your value with your client because your client would uh, uh, value your network more than you alone. Yeah, so they can't leave you because they know you connected them to this and that. Thank you. Thank you, Lena Silk. And there is, there is a very interesting question here has to do with whether um, we require a peculiar or unique restructuring or reorganization regime for SMEs. So it says, do you think small businesses in Nigeria would benefit from a unique reorganization regime or legal framework similar to the debtor in possession regime in the US? Oh, well, that's, uh, yeah, I agree with you. It's a very interesting uh, question. Um, and uh, honestly, I, I think that we do. We do need a special regime for small companies. Uh, but uh, as you know, most small companies um, are what you would call business names. And therefore, uh, actually fall in between uh, small co- companies and the um, uh, personal bankruptcy law. So uh, I will push a little bit further uh, than the question and uh, say that um, without prejudice to whoever is going to talk about the personal insolvency law, 
that our personal insolvency law compared to where we are in the corporate insolvency law is way behind. And so we need to actually reform that to make it easier to resolve personal bankruptcy. And within that context, to then make a provision for small businesses, because most of those small businesses are actually personal businesses that fall under personal insolvency law. Yeah. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Thank you, Leonard Silk. So um, there's another question here, wants to know the role of legal practitioners in the insolvency and restructuring space. Whether legal practitioners, we as legal practitioners, whether we have the obligation of advising our clients in appropriate circumstances to opt for corporate restructuring rather than outright liquidation. I mean, personally, I've had experiences where banks would tell you that what they want, that they want you to file a um, winding up petition because they know that that would untwist the other party into paying. So what role do we as legal practitioners have in circumstances like this? Uh, thank you so much. Um, well, you know, um, I, I always tell my client that a clerk is somebody you you give instruction carry this file from this place to that place and all that you know they just follow that i'm an advisor so i advise right um and, but there are times that i advise and the client may take a different perspective usually to protect myself i would uh, make sure i put my advice in writing and then i would uh, get a waiver from the client um because tomorrow they may turn around to blame you um in my experience uh particularly since i'm also licensed to practice in canada i see that a lot you see it uh, when you look at the jurisprudence there a lot of the uh complaints against lawyers is that um, the lawyer they didn't get access to good advice you know uh, and when that comes up the question that to arise is did you did you give them their options and then they made their choice you know and things like that so so um as we improve our um uh, professional responsibility uh, laws and enforcement it will become more and more important for lawyers to make sure that they advise their clients properly and then make sure that um if their clients insist on a particular option that they are protected in case. That's that's the first thing I would uh, say. But then on the other hand, you have the other lawyer on the other side. Um, so that's why law is um, what what the key thing that we get from law school really is uh, critical thinking, preparing us for problem solving, right? So um, and that's where law is one of the most innovative courses, and and that's why lawyers prosper. Not only in law, but in business, in politics, etc., because the equipment we get from school is on this and section that. So uh, it's then therefore for the lawyer on the other side to also be innovative when you are faced with a situation where uh, one side wants to go for bankruptcy, but you think you are the lawyer on the other side, and you think maybe a restructuring is better then you have to look at the options that are available to your client and then see how you can railroad them towards your own side. And um, yes, I've seen so many cases that start as winding up, end up as a settlement. So many. I've seen, I've done one where the people went for, um, uh, the, where the, the cases where they would go for even um, uh, for a domestic company with no risk of flight, they will go for atom pillar order uh, with a, a winding up petition. And you've already obtained Atom Pillar, which basically strangles the company, right? And then uh, then you get a settlement, right? And then they want to... We, we settled because the client said, I thought, I thought the, the process was wrong, was an abuse. But the client said, no, we can't do business 
with the entrepreneur order in force, all our bank accounts are frozen. So we have no choice. So they negotiated. We did a settlement. After the settlement, they tried to make a judgment in the court. I refused. We opposed it. That it couldn't be judgment in the winding up petition. Like if they want to, if my client defaults, they have to start a new um, case to, because they are trying to improve their position, you know, become secured. Uh, and they were unsecured creditors. And because I understood restructuring, I understood the um, um, the issues, the, the securities that were involved and the rest. And we successfully opposed the uh, that terms of settlement being made consent judgment. And uh, meanwhile, my client uh, paid. The uh, order was discharged. They, uh, and my client paid in accordance with the pay some installments. The lawyer will write to me. I will get in touch with my client. Somehow we resolve the matter. And they liquidated the debt. So you need the uh, innovation on the two sides. Yeah, that's that's how uh, it happens. And that's not the only one where people use the winding up and we ended up with a restructuring. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Leonard Silk. And then there's a question here in relation to concern about delays in our court system. So the attendee asks, should the Federal High Court create a fast track process for new for the new restructuring measures to avoid unnecessary delays? And that's bearing in mind that, I mean, this involves money and money has time value. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I think we can reform our processes. Uh, I believe that, um, in our processes, uh, uh, both in the High Court, uh, the Federal High Court, and with lawyers themselves, you know, um, Okure will tell you when we when when uh, Insul uh, Africa Roundtable started. The first one was in Nigeria. We fought for it. It took place in Abuja, and Okure went for it, and um, a judge. An English judge, you know. So Corey asked him the question that, that um, how come, you know, you don't have a lot of uh, uh, disputes or cases or appeals in insolvency in England? He smiled. The, the judge, the English judge smiled and said, yes, we don't. Why? Because everybody knows the issue. The lawyers are highly knowledgeable and they're highly professional. The judges are also highly knowledgeable. So, in fact, if you are looking for the big decisions in insolvency in England, you have to go and read the high court decisions because hardly anybody. So, because the the everybody knows what they are supposed to do. So, so it's not only the courts. In fact, make most of the problems of the courts is not uh, from some of the research I've done and my publication of the Nigerian courts. It's not actually the procedures. It's usually calendaring, technology issues, and knowledge, right? So, so the and the, the, we can work on that, right? Uh, you can have any procedure. I know, say they did the AMCOM special procedure. What has been the result? Uh, they did so many. That, those are not the issues. It's just the the mere administrative management of the court is the major problem that they have it. And then the second problem is the knowledge, not only on the part of the lawyers, but of the judges, but the lawyers. So once we can do more training, everybody knows the, the time of the day, you know. Uh, uh, you don't have frivolity uh, at the beginning uh, about the honest debtor, right? In most systems, people come and say, at ah, least I'm bankrupt. This is everything I have. You can go and investigate. You will not see anything else hidden somewhere under the pillow. They have disclosed everything they have, right? But look at our own practices, you know? So that's the, 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 the system problem that we need to deal with that has to do with values and then other things, you know, uh, uh, yeah, that we need to deal with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leonard. So there are still so many questions here, and that attests to the quality of your presentation, sir. But unfortunately, 
we are, we've run out of time. So I want to thank you once more as I hand over to uh, the chairman, Tobena, to give his vote of, a proper vote of thanks and closing remarks. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Kubi. Um, what can I Thank say? You. Uh, what, can, what can I say, Leonard Silk? Um, what a brilliant presentation. Um, at the beginning, I thought that there would be no questions, but uh, it appears that the delegates were listening attentively, absorbing uh, the lecture that uh, no one sent in any question until the end. But when the questions started flowing, it became quite evident that um, people had absorbed the content of the lecture and um, that they found it very illuminating. And the, the, the questions was quite insightful too. So let us say thank you very much on behalf of the Nigerian Bar Association and especially on behalf of the Institute of Continuing Legal Education of, of the MBA. We're so happy that you've given to us again, as you usually do, um, a very brilliant presentation, um, well thought through. And I, I'm sure that anybody who's listened today would at least have a fundamental foundational background of insolvency it was more than we expected. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Okay. See you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, delegates, for yeah. coming. Uh, the session continues the next um presentation continues tomorrow at 2 p.m. So do log in and then um, I hope you found it illuminating. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Okoria Kahlo, for uh, your industry. Thank you, Dr. Kubi Dofia, for your industry and support. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>